Single Phase Transformers, Part 5 of 5. In this presentation, we'll be looking at instrument transformer applications, instrument tr transformer function, and calculating with instrument transformers. Instrument transformer applications. Where are these things used? Well, there's a lot of different installations where the electrical system will operate at values which far exceed the ratings of the equipment required to monitor them. What I have a picture of here is a steam fire generation facility or a steam powered generation facility. Steam is generated and then pushed through turbines which turn a generator. The generator is going to generate a voltage that is in the thousands of volts. So 4,000, 14,000, maybe 12,000 volts. The voltage will have to be monitored, but how will it be monitored? Because any type of voltage measuring device will be rated at a maximum of 600 volts. So in order to measure the voltage coming off this alternator, we will have to use a transformer to bump the voltage down at a predetermined ratio. And so for that application, we'll use potential transformers or PTs. The other application that we're gonna have that requires instrument transformers is when the current value or the current output is higher than the rating of the measuring equipment. Ammeters historically have been bolted onto the line conductor in order to measure the full amount of current of that system. When we have current values that exceed the rating of the ammeter, we need to then use an instrument transformer so that we can bump that current down to a value that my meter can actually measure. So these are known as current transformers or CTs. Of the two instrument transformers, CTs are by far the most common. And a good example of a CT is your commonly used clamp ammeter. Instrument transformer function. So how exactly do these things work? Well, a current transformer is a pretty simple device. It is a transformer, but the primary is set up to carry all of the load current without any resistance being introduced. So the load current flows through the center of this bar type CT, and there is a winding around that one bar. And the winding is set up in such a way that the maximum or the, the rated value will always be five amps. So there are connections on the top surface of this item to connect an ammeter to, and they are two terminals here and here. You'll notice that there's also a shorting bar. The shorting bar we'll take a look at in a few minutes. So it transforms high current to low current. This is a better illustrate or picture of a CT. It's a bar type CT. This here would be a connection to another type of potential transformer or perhaps to the utility meter. This would be the, the main current of the supply circuit that's going off to the consumer perhaps. Now, these two connections here are for the uh, ammeter that would be measuring this current and this is a shorting bar. When there is no ammeter connected to these terminals and there is current flowing through the primary, we need to close the shorting bar and short circuit the secondary. If we don't, there's a high likelihood that we will get a, a high voltage generated across these two terminals and damage will result to the CT and, and potentially other equipment in the cabinet with it. There's lots of different types of CT forms out there. Bar type, window type are the most common. Uh, window type, a lot of people will be familiar with this style where you really can just mount it wherever and it, and it hangs on the conductor sometimes. And there are the two connection points for our secondary going off to an ammeter or perhaps even a utility energy meter. Common ratings are 200 to 5, 400 to 5, 1000 to 5. And what that's in reference to is how many amps would be flowing on the bar and how many amps would then be present on the secondary. So a 400 to 5 would mean it has a ratio 
of 80 to 1. Now, CTs are kind of interesting, instrument transformers, because their output is always rated at 5 amps, always. And that's because these were primarily used for utility metering, and the utilities energy meters would be calibrated to accept a maximum value of current. Now, it does not mean that this particular CT can handle a, a maximum of 400 amps. And we'll take a look a little bit later, it can handle quite a bit more. So with this um, ratio of 80 to one, it means that for every 80 amps that flows through the primary, one amp will flow through the secondary. So here's a 400 to five CT. We've got large conductors here that are gonna take all the line current all the way through perhaps for a large service. A 400 to five means an 80 to one ratio. So if we had a current value of 412 amps, how many amps would I expect to see on the secondary connecting off to an ammeter? Well, we would take our ratio and we would calculate 400 divided, sorry, 412 divided by 80. So 412 divided by 80, which gives me 500, 5.15 amps. So I've got a typo there, it should say 412, 412. So our ammeter would register 5.15 amps. And if I knew what the ratio was, I could multiply that and know exactly how many amps are flowing through the CT. Let's say I had 612 amps instead. 612 amps flowing through, same CT, 80 to one. How many amps would be flowing on the secondary to the ammeter? Well, again, we would take 612 divided by 80, and we'd end up with 7.65 amps. So CTs sometimes can be adjusted through the manufacturer design connection taps, and other times we can use a CT to adjust what the perceived value of current is by looping a conductor through a CT multiple times. And this can be done on purpose for different applications depending on what the system requires. On most CTs, what you're gonna have is a rating factor. The rating factor is used to determine how much the primary current can be increased beyond the CT nameplate rating. So the CT that we've been dealing with, a 400 to five, if it had a rating factor of two, the rating factor is the item that is multiplied by the initial 400 amp rating. So that means that that CT can safely handle 800 amps, 400 times two. And with 800 amps, we would expect to get a secondary current of 10 amps. Interesting to note, CTs are most accurate when operated above their nameplate current because they are magnetically saturated. It means they're highly accurate and when we're doing revenue metering, so we're charging someone for a product, that has to be highly accurate in order to validate the billing. Again, the secondary circuit of a CT is never to have an overcurrent on it and it should always be connected to an ammeter or utility energy meter. And again, if no meter is connected to the secondary, the terminals must be short circuited together. And usually there is a bar provided by the manufacturer that is uh, mounted to the equipment that allows us to do this quite easily. So where do we commonly see these installed? Well, a lot of electrical services will have CTs because the amperage value far exceeds the rating of a standard line, line value rated meter. So we have a CT cabinet with CTs inside the cabinet, and then we have conductors that come off of the secondaries and go up into the meter base and connect to the meter itself. Of course, we have to use a different meter. So this is an example of picture of a transformer rated meter. It says transformer rated 10 amps only, which is much different than the standard meter that you would have in your house that's probably rated to 200 amps. Also connected, states here, 
short circuit current transformer before removing meter. So they don't want someone just pulling the meter off without first short circuiting the CTs in the CT cabinet. Sometimes what we're gonna have is what's called a 13 jaw meter base. And a 13 jaw meter base is used because it has test switches in it. Now it can be used with PTs and CTs, but what's helpful with CTs is that the test switches can be uh, operated to short circuit the CT from the meter base location as opposed to actually opening up the CT cabinet and physically touching and, and moving items while there's still current flowing on the primaries. So this can be a safer alternative. So what about potential transformers? Well, a potential transformer will transform a high voltage potential to a low voltage. And the secondary output that we're gonna get for something like this is 120 volts. So the secondary output is always rated 120 when we're dealing with potential transformers. And again, the reason for this is that historically, Potential transformers were used with utility metering and utility meters operated at 120 volts. If you had a 240 volt service, you would have to have potential transformers. If you had a 600 or 480 volt service, you would have to have potential transformers to bump the voltage down to what the meter could read, which was 120. PTs and CTs both have polarity markings. And these are important when you are using them both together, as in an installation that has PTs and CTs connected into the circuit. Or if you're using three of these, so three CTs or three PTs for a three-phase system, it does matter in those installations which direction these are mounted. Let's do a calculation with some instrument transformers and see how uh, the functioning takes place. So here's a typical CT and PT installation. Our PT is located here and it is connected between the two conductors giving us the, the high voltage side and the low voltage side. And you'll notice the dots are in the same uh, orientation as the dot on the CT. So the CT faces, the dot faces the supply, and the dot on my PT also faces the supply. So they have to be orientated in the same manner. My CT is connected to an ammeter and then to the watt meter, my energy meter from the utility. My PT is connected to a voltmeter and then to the energy meter of the utility. So there are those polarity markings, and again, fairly important in how they are situated. So let's say we have 652 amps flowing on the line conductors, and the potential voltage between these two points is not a perfect 2400, because very rarely will you ever read the exact nominal system voltage. Try measuring the voltage at your house. I'm sure it isn't 120 exactly. So we have a PT in there that's rated 2400 to 120. And we have a CT rated 600 to 5. Before we go any further, what we need to do with these two values is calculate out what their ratios are. So it's pretty simple. We're going to take 2400 and divide it, or, or sorry, uh, 2400 and divide 120 into it and get a ratio. And then we're going to take 600 and divide 5 into it and get a ratio for that one. So what we have is a PT with a ratio of 20 to 1 and a CT with a ratio of 120 to 1. At this point, what we're going to do is calculate what the voltage is on this voltmeter. So we've got 2389 volts and a 20 to 1 PT rating. So if we're familiar with ratios, it means that we're going to take 2389 and divide it by 20. So that means that the voltmeter, which is on the PT secondary, should be registering about 119.45 volts. The CT is connected to an ammeter. What value is the ammeter reading? Well, it's 120 to 1, 
and it's 652 amps. So 652 divided by 120 gives me 5.43 amps. So the ammeter is registering 5.43 and the PT or the volted voltmeter is measuring 119.45. So if we take these two values together, if we were only given the voltmeter and the ammeter values, and we knew what the ratios were of those two devices, the PT and the CT, we could still work out what the total amount of watts was of the main system. And the way that we would do that is we would take 20, which is our PT ratio times 119.45 volts and multiply it by 120, which is the ratio of our CT, and multiply it by 5.43, giving us 1.55 megawatts worth of power. Now I understand, why would you go through this process if you already knew 652 and 2389? And the answer is, we probably wouldn't. But remember, the only way we're going to be able to validate that there's 652 amps is through a CT that has a ratio. And the only way we can validate there's 2389 is through a PT and a PT ratio. Let's try another one. This time, what we're gonna do is calculate circuit values from the CT and PT secondary values. So I have a voltmeter with 112.3 volts, and I have an ammeter with 3.65 amps. I'm using the uh, slightly different PT and CTs. So the PT is 4160 to 120, and the CT is 200 to 5. So let's break these down to their ratios. So the PT is 34.66 to 1, and the CT is 40 to 1. If we utilize what we understand about the ratio and the value that's being measured by the voltmeter, we can multiply these two values together. So 112.3 times 34.66. Actual line voltage at this point is 3,893 3, volts. What about the true current value? How many amps is actually flowing on the line? Well, we're going to take 3.65 amps and multiply it by 40. The actual line current is 146 amps. If we were to take these two values now and multiply them together, we could work out the power being consumed by our load over here. So 34. 0.66 times 112.3 times 40 times 3.65 gives me 568 kilowatts worth of power. So you'll notice that there are two different ways you can calculate total watts of the load, either by using the actual values or by using the secondary CT and PT values along with the ratios. So what additional uses do we have of CTs? Well, we can confirm ground faults in GFCI devices. We can confirm the presence of current in impedance grounding systems. And we can also operate contacts at predetermined current levels, which is often known as a current switch. Now, these are just some of the additional uses of CTs. There are far more out in industry. So here's a GFCI. You've probably seen this diagram before in previous uh, training sessions or technical training years. When all the conductors are passed through a window type CT, the net flux should be equal to zero. If there is any resultant flux, it means some of the current is not passing through the CT. And so what we can see here is that inside a GFCI protected receptacle or breaker, both of the current, both of the conductors rather, pass through the window of the CT. And if they're both equal, it means that the net flux would be zero. And the net flux would mean zero amps on the secondary. In this situation, we have a installation where one amp goes out, but only three quarters of an amp goes back. Because of that, there is a net flux difference between those two conductors, and there will be current flowing on the secondary which when amplified will operate a coil and open a set of contacts automatically de-energizing the system. So GFCI is quite a clever use of a CT.
you can say, see the same concept at work with your own clamp ammeter by clamping both conductors of a branch circuit inside the window. And the two fluxes will cancel each other, giving us a resultant of zero amps. You can even do this with a three-phase circuit. Impedance grounding systems will use a CT to monitor when is their current flowing on this ground conductor. And we put a large chunk of resistance in series with the ground conductor and the CT will register when current flows through it and send that signal off to the control module. So CTs are used in lots of situations where I simply want to know, is there current? Is there no current? One of the other ways we can use it is with what's called a current switch. Now there's no secondary voltage connections on a current switch. And what instead it has is a couple of terminals for a normally open or a normally closed contact. So what it has inside it, it's got a little relay and it's using the secondary voltage of that coil to operate the relay. So when the current reaches a predetermined value, which is set by that little screw there, it will close the set of contacts and we can use it to then operate any other type of predetermined control sequence that we need. Current switches are used a lot in HVAC controls. That brings us to the end of single phase transformers. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation and it gives you a better appreciation of how transformers are used out in the field as an electrician.